Thanks. Thanks, Access Now. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, let's give a couple minutes um, for folks to file into the room, uh, get your coffee, get your seat, uh, get your water. Um, and we'll start up in just a second with our panel. Um, so again, this is searching for the next UN Special Rapporteur on the right to privacy. We are going to be uh, exploring the whole universe of the special procedures of the Human Rights Council, the, um, where they sit in the UN human rights system, uh, how these global experts are selected, supported, um, what their mandates are, and uh, how you can put yourself forward uh, to step into the shoes of this really important role or um, be one of the contributors. Um, so we've got a Distinguished panel, um, we're gonna start uh, with uh, questions straight to the panelists. Um, we're also going to open uh, after that to uh, questions, comments from all of you at home. Uh, and you can add those onto the um, Q and A, the live chat section of the YouTube page um, that you're probably watching. And uh, we will collect those. So um, please feel free to add those throughout. Um, we will collect your questions and put them to the panelists. Um, cool, uh, another housekeeping. Um, panelists are going to uh, keep video on, mics off. And uh, without further ado, I think we can get started. Um, so I'm Peter Mysek, I'm general counsel and uh, for these purposes, UN policy manager at Access Now. Uh, we're a global NGO, been around about 10 years and uh, really proud to have our accreditation at the UN. Um, and uh, the UN's work has been uh, central to our mission uh, to ensure that the UN is fit for purpose in the digital age uh, and all of its organs, its experts, are really urgently focused on the intersection of human rights and technology. Um, a lot of the experts that we have here today uh, have put in countless hours um, supporting the work of this uh, somewhat underfunded institution um, that does depend on uh, the role of civil society. So uh, all the panelists I think today come from uh, civil society broadly from different organizations uh, that we'll get into. Um, we've uh, also are looking forward to uh, the former Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Opinion, David Kay, um, current law professor um, at University of California, Irvine, to join us at the end to wrap up um, and provide that kind of inside perspective um, from having served in uh, this, this role of leading a mandate. So um, to introduce, uh, introduce the topic, um, as I said, we're in the realm of the human rights system of the UN. Human rights is one of the three pillars of United Nations work, along with peace and security and development. Um, unfortunately, human rights has uh, probably the least funding out of all three of those pillars. Or the OHCHR is around 3.7% of uh, the total UN budget. Um, they rely on a lot of kind of voluntary donations and uh, this role, the role of the special procedures and the mandates are unfunded and the UN is quite open about that. Um, and uh, in that sense, it, it relies on these mandate holders, these individual independent experts rely on uh, the rest of us to, to complete their missions. And uh, in, in that sense, we are trying to drum up support and interest in uh, holding this mandate. Um, we want these mandates um, and the work of the UN generally to keep up with the state of the world. Um, we want uh, what's going on and what's impacting human rights in the world to be reflected in the work. And we want them to study um, those human rights impacts and draw lessons that advance norms and uh, eventually laws and regulations and, and state and corporate compliance. So uh, this mandate that we're talking about today, we'll hear about more um, from our first speaker, first speaker Tommaso Falchetta, um, who is here from Privacy International. He's their global policy lead and uh, has really been hand in glove with um, this mandate uh, since before its inception. Um, this mandate was rather recently created, uh, to put it in context, the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression was created in 1993. 
Um, and, uh, and I think that kind of matches um, the way that privacy has been a little bit forgotten in uh, the UN human rights system. And we've all been working hard to, uh, to turn that around and uh, reverse the tide and, and show that this is an essential and fundamental right, um, an enabling right in the digital age. So um, without more from me, um, happy to welcome Tommaso Falqueta um, from an undisclosed location. Uh, Tommaso, um, can you tell us how you got involved in, um, and uh, why this mandate was created? Um, just tell the origin story, if you would. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for organizing this. Um, yes, I was looking back when it was created in uh, uh, 2015. Um, and actually, in a way, the, the mandate was created in response uh, uh, to a, a rising of uh, attention and concerns around privacy, uh, which was uh, resulting from the Snowden uh, revelations around that time. Uh, and then around that time, uh, um, Apart from, I'm not talking about the, the civil societies immediately, but uh, looking at states, some states took the initiative to bring uh, the issues around uh, the right to privacy in the digital age uh, within the UN uh, uh, human rights system. Uh, and as you rightly say, the right to privacy was a bit of a forgotten right with some of the UN uh, human rights mechanism. Uh, it was uh, with, with an exception of the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of, of Expression and the Special Rapporteur on Counterterrorism and Human Rights that had dedicated some, uh, some, uh, some specific reports on uh, issues related to privacy and their mandate. Um, so back at the time, uh, there wasn't very much. Um, and um, Germany and Brazil, with some other states, uh, introduced resolutions at uh, the UN General Assembly and the Human Rights Council on the right to privacy in the digital age. Um, and um, soon after, uh, there was uh, an initiative uh, to push for the creation of the mandate of a special rapporteur on the right to privacy. So creating a mandate to fill a gap in the protection mechanism that uh, uh, was felt uh, needed filling at that time, and rightly so. Um, so civil societies were very much in su supporting these, uh, these initiatives. Um, I mean, uh, um, as, um, and we had, I guess, uh, some particular issues that we wanted to see reflected in the mandate, uh, and in that we were in uh, quite in good agreement with, uh, with, uh, with those proponents uh, of the mandate, and I'm just going to run through them very quickly. Uh, firstly was uh, the idea that the mandate is about uh, the right to privacy, and uh, that is an important aspect uh, that you see in the, in the resolution that created the mandate in 2015 and, uh, and also in the uh, resolution last week that uh, renewed the mandate. So right to privacy has uh, already enshrined uh, both in uh, the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights in Article 12 and uh, in uh, Article 17 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So not a new right per se, uh, it's just a new mandate um, to, to, to help protect and, and respect that right. The second aspect was clearly um, a, a demand to, um, to consider uh, um, the challenges of, of new technologies in, uh, in, the, in the promotion of respect and respect of, of, uh, of the right to privacy. So while, uh, while um, um, while the mandate is on Article 12 and 17, as I mentioned, uh, the, the, the resolution does make references to uh, the challenges arising from new and emerging technologies in, uh, in, uh, in, in implementing, uh, implementing the obligations around these provisions. And that's quite important, uh, and uh, we see through uh, the work of the of the special rapporteur, and very likely to the work of the next uh, of the next mandate holder. Um, the other aspect I wanted to raise is that uh, at that time, uh, when, when it was created, surveillance by states was clearly uh, the the focus uh, of some of the concerns, particularly by those. Um, um, those creating, uh, pushing for the creation of the mandate. And as I mentioned, uh, the Snowden revelation were just one example of that. Um, as, um, as the years went by, 
um, the, the, the resolution on the right to privacy in the digital age adopted by the council and by the General Assembly uh, also broaden the scope uh, of concerns and looking also at the roles of companies. Uh, so looking at uh, issues around uh, data protection, uh, issues around uh, exploitation of data and uh, uh, abuses of privacy by private actors as, as in companies. Uh, but also looking, uh, looking, back, uh, uh, looking back on the role of states in regulating, uh, in regulating the, uh, the activities of these companies. Uh, so I think uh, it's important uh, to, to remember that the mandate uh, has this kind of scope that covers both, uh, uh, I mean, is the reason really both because it's not a dichotomy, but basically covering uh, state surveillance, but also covering the role of companies uh, uh, in, uh, um, in, abusing, uh, um, in abusing the right to privacy. I mean. um, I can just add the last point I want to make at this initial initial stage is that uh, the other priority for civil societies was uh, to make sure that uh, uh, what was created was a special procedure with all the powers that other special procedures have, all the activities that uh, that uh, other special rapporteurs uh, uh, carry out. And you know, you mentioned uh, you mentioned the special rapporteur on uh, freedom of expression, but a lot of other of uh, a, a lot of other uh, thematic uh, special procedures. Have a range of powers that are pretty much similar across uh, across each mandate. It was very important for uh, for us that the special rapporteur on privacy also had a similar um, a similar broad range of, uh, of of activities. So just just to run through them very quickly, uh, responding to allegations of violations or abuses of privacy. Um, including a, a allegation by individuals or by, uh, by civil societies representing or, or uh, conveying concerns about individuals. Um, and in that responding, also responding to, to developments, uh, let's say a new legislation being adopted in a particular state uh, on surveillance or on privacy related matter. Uh, the, the special rapporteur in the current mandate has the capacity to intervene in these situations. Uh, conducting country visits is uh, something very important that all special procedures uh, do, and uh, so this mandate does as well. Carry out the, uh, drafting and consulting on thematic issues, uh, so identifying the key sort of thematic areas uh, within uh, the right to privacy that needs to be uh, spotlighted uh, and um, reflected upon with recommendations uh, uh, both for states, companies, and, and other stakeholders. Um, and in, in, that, in that sense, also carrying out consultations, both with uh, civil societies, but also with other stakeholders. And finally, uh, reporting uh, annually to the Human Rights Council and to the General Assembly, uh, which is uh, a key aspect of, of the mandate because it allows uh, uh, the, the mandate to bring uh, uh, the, the concerns and the attention of these, uh, of these bodies. Um, I stop here. Uh, maybe we can we can go on later for with something else. Thanks, Thank Samasa. Yeah, um, and uh, I think that's a very important point that you drew out. This is not a new right. Um, it's a it's a new mandate, um, and uh, so I think yeah, there's a lot of catching up that that needs to be done. Um, that still needs to be done even after six years. Um, we've had one um, mandate holder, two terms. Uh, for the past six years and uh, and are looking for the new one now. Um, can you just really quickly um, set out the selection process? I think we'll get a link to the actual application and um, and some of the places where people can go online to apply, but uh, just can you just run through the the checklist of how this person is selected? Sure. Yes, it's um it's it's very well set out uh, in uh, in the web page of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, which includes uh, uh, both uh, uh, links uh, to the uh, to the application form and the, uh, um, the the online survey that needs to be uh, filled in by by uh, by a candidate, uh, uh, but also as a range of uh, question and answers, which are, which are very useful, I think, and very informative. Uh, it also includes uh, uh, a, an email in case. Uh, uh, someone needs uh, further information and get stuck in the process. But very briefly, uh, the application itself, uh, there is a deadline of 13 uh, of April, so just two weeks away, for uh, any individual uh, who wish to, to present uh, its candidacy. And um, 
and, and as I said, the, the, the web page of the, of the Office of the Commissioner includes uh, the link to the form and, uh, and all the instructions of how to, how to fill it and, and, uh, and present it. Uh, within the form, uh, there is uh, also a letter of motivation where a, a candidate will explain uh, why and what he will do as, uh, as a special rapporteur if, if, uh, if selected. Um, uh, when uh, when the, the, the applications are collected, so after the 13th of, of April, there is a, a selection process which uh, begins with a consultative group, uh, which is made of uh, five ambassadors from uh, member states of the Human Rights Council, one ambassador per each uh, uh, regional group of the UN. Uh, these five ambassadors meet, uh, the, um, review the applications uh, on the basis of criteria that are uh, publicly available, uh, and then uh, make uh, a short list uh, and carry out uh, a, a telephone interview with shortlisted candidates. Following that, uh, they, they, they uh, agree on uh, usually a list of uh, up to three candidates that they put forward to the president of the Human Rights Council. And the president of the Human Rights Council uh, with some consultation within the council itself, uh, then uh, put forward, identify the appropriate candidate among, uh, among the, the, those shortlisted by the, uh, by the consultative group uh, and, uh, and put it forward for the council um, for, uh, for which, you know, for approval. Um, and that is, uh, is usually done, uh, well, it will be done uh, in, um, in, in the June session of the council, usually it's done on the last day of, of the session. Um, that's very quick, uh, quick run through. Uh, yeah. There are more details in the in the in the web page that I mentioned. Thank you. Thanks, Tomato. Yeah. Um, so uh, you'll have a telephone interview with five ambassadors from all over the world. Um, so I want to uh, yeah to go to next um, Paula Martins Martin at uh, Association for Progressive Communications. Um, as a uh, Global South-based association, um, APC has been an essential uh, player uh, for decades um, at the United Nations, expanding accessibility for civil society and uh, ensuring that the mandates like these are um, paying attention to the most urgent issues um, that matter really at the community level where that where the impacts on human rights, on um, development, peace and security actually matter. So um, Paola, thank you for, for joining us. Um, we've heard a lot about uh, you know, this mandate at the kind of UN level, which is often pretty, pretty insular, insulated and removed. Um, so I wanted to ask you how this mandate can better support the work of APC's member organizations, um, many of whom work at you know, local and community levels or maybe the national level. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for the question and for the invitation for bringing us together here today. Um, and as you were saying, so APC is uh, both an organization and a network of members um, in more than 70 countries now, mainly in the global south. And what we see in the interaction with our members and partners is really that this mandate is um, extremely relevant to the work that these organizations are doing at the national and local level. Um, but I would say that the opposite is also true. So um, the work of these organizations is extremely relevant to the work of the mandate. And I think that's very important and we should discuss because the way we see it, we are really talking about a communication cycle. So these groups are on the ground collecting data, collecting information, so they are the ones identifying trends, main challenges, um, systematic violations. And for us, the idea is that they will fit in this, um, all this information to the mandate. And these would be um, the basis for the decision making then um, that, the, that this is how the special rapporteur will decide on the type of engagement he will or she will have at the international level in terms of standard setting, in terms of promoting uh, new standards or refining standards. And then the final part of the cycle is that the same groups will then take these standards and bring them back to the national and local level and use the standards for advocacy, for litigation, sometimes I would say even for inspiration, for thinking of new interventions. So 
the way we look at it is really that this has to be a two-way avenue um, and um, a good mandate really is based on a mandate holder that um, listens, truly listens and engages with different types of civil society, um, not only international ones, but of course these groups as well um, that are working locally. And um, just building on the activities that Tommaso was mentioning before, I think it's really important. What we saw in the work of the previous rapporteur is that uh, the comments to bills and legislation was something really important. And these are other ways in which the special rapporteur directly gets involved with country situations. Um, this is really important for this type of engagement that I was mentioning before. And I think one particularly interesting tool in this regard are the country visits. So we really feel that the country visits, and of course the following report that comes out of, the, um, of these missions, um, they provide a very interesting opportunity, not only for the groups to engage with the mandate in the planning and the execution of the mission, but also it's an opportunity to raise the profile of privacy as an important human right at the country level. It also like helps uh, mobilize civil society around this issue. Sometimes it opens space for mood stakeholder dialogue discussions spaces that were not open before. So we really feel that that's a particularly interesting um, activity that can be performed, that can be pushed and carried out by the special rapporteur. So we really are looking forward for the new mandate holder to maybe explore even more these, uh, these opportunities. Absolutely, thank you. I think that that two-way street is 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 so right. Um, these mandate holders are are constantly looking for you know what should they be focused on, and um, uh, that absolutely has to be informed uh, at the local level. Um, and so, yeah, is that uh, you mentioned country visits as as a key thing, and uh, the former um, you know, the outgoing special rapporteur on the right to privacy, Joseph Canatachi, was very willing to um, to speak up about uh, even legislation in, in draft form bills um, and undertake those country visits. Um, uh, great. Um, thank you for, for pulling that out. Um, I want to uh, turn to uh, Nicholas from um, ICNL and uh, ICNL Alliance. Um, and uh, we have heard, yeah, um, uh, from a, a couple of different perspectives. I think ICNL um, has a as a more of an inside perspective as, as really the um, a bit of the secretariat or the supporting role for a mandate holder, um, uh, specifically the mandate um, of the Special Rapporteur on the Freedoms of Peaceful Assembly and Association. Um, that's one of the, last I checked, 44 thematic mandates um, that are supported uh, by the OHCHR, um, the special procedures, in addition to, uh, I think, more than 10 uh, country specific mandates. And so it's really a broad spectrum of uh, mandates that uh, require support from within the OHCHR and without from orgs like, uh, like yours. Um, so yeah, I wonder, Nicholas, if you could tell us um, how might this um, next mandate holder on privacy work more closely and effectively with, with other special procedures like the one that you uh, support um, and um, yeah, please inform us from your global perspective uh, as a really expert organization looking at national laws and legislation uh, and the rule of law. Um, Thank you, Peter. <clears throat> um, you know, a lot of, of really interesting groundwork has been laid for the points I want to make here. So I'm going to be drawing on what you've said, what Tommaso and what Paula have said. But, but you're right, Peter. Right now, to my knowledge as well, we are currently 44 thematic mandates special procedures and independent experts, and 11 country experts. And I think the really important point to keep in mind here is, is a really, it's a foundational one for human rights. And that is that human rights are, are interdependent and indivisible. So when you start to think about the fact that there are 44 different thematic rapporteurs, it becomes very quickly apparent that they're doing a lot of work that's going to overlap with one just on the starting from the assumption that the rights are interdependent. That makes it very important as well that they collaborate. They think about how their mandates are interdependent as well as the rights and thematic approaches that or issues that they are covering. So what does that mean really in practice? 
Um, Peter, you, you started this out rightly by pointing out that these, these rapporteurs, these mandate holders are unpaid and volunteer. Um, that means that collaboration has to be really strategic and it has to be carefully planned. So I would suggest that for a privacy mandate holder, what that might look like is identifying other rapporteurs who are working on issues closely related to privacy and then ensuring that communication between those mandates takes place on a regular basis and that the mandates conduct their regular activities as laid out by Tommaso in a strategically coordinated fashion. Um, key mandates from my point of view for the next mandate holder to consider include freedom of expression. You, you mentioned that we may be joined by David Kay later and I think that's going to be a critical mandate for the new privacy rapporteur to collaborate with. But others include freedom of association and assembly. Again, Peter, as you mentioned, um, we work closely with that mandate. And I know that that mandate is quite interested in issues of privacy as they relate to the, to the exercise of association and assembly rights. I would also posit that it is important to think about the collaboration that could be had between this rapporteur and the counterterrorism and human rights rapporteur. Unlike this privacy mandate, counterterrorism and human rights mandate actually covers the exercise of human rights across a sector, the counterterrorism sector, rather than a particular theme, meaning that she, in this case, Special Rapporteur Thanula Nyeyline, does actually work on privacy issues. Um, in the counterterrorism context, that means looking at what information is collected about individuals when they travel across borders, or looking at the maintenance of databases of biometric information about people suspected of or considered likely to engage in terrorism, both which are areas where huge privacy uh, issues arise. So I would suggest that mandate also could be a really fruitful area for collaboration. And a final point, what does collaboration actually look like between these mandates? Because again, volunteers without much support, they have to be very careful about what their work looks like and how they prioritize. What we've seen historically as effective collaboration between mandates typically involves joint statements or positions issued around, as Paula was talking about, acute situations at the country level, because that often will actually elicit a response from the state, as well as carefully planned efforts to further articulate underdeveloped international norms that lie at the intersection between several mandate holders' um, purviews. And here, I think, again, I've mentioned a couple rapporteurs who have intersecting responsibilities, but I think as technology advances, as COVID has demonstrated, the target around privacy is constantly moving as situations in the world change. So it'll be important for this new mandate holder to find those other rapporteurs who are willing to collectively and clearly articulate what the, the right to privacy means in our current context. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Yeah, that's um, that's really, really insightful to to think about. Yeah, the um, especially the counterterror mandate, um, not just being uh, on one theme, but sort of an instrumental uh, approach. Um, thank, thank you. I, yeah, I do want to. Um, if anyone plans on applying to be the next special rapporteur on privacy, you can just raise your hand on the Zoom uh, or let us know. Um, I'm sure, we'd all love to to hear your stump speeches. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, we want to promote this. Um, this is uh, something that's essential for civil society. Um, and uh, all of our work, I think, around civic space in the digital age. And, and then, yeah, as Nicholas said, a number of other um, fields of, uh, of absolutely essential um, work. Um, while you think about whether you're going to apply, um, I want to uh, bring up uh, to uh, our last speaker of this panel portion, um, Laura O'Brien, UN Advocacy Officer at Access Now, um, where I work, full disclosure, um, but Laura has done a lot of work um, uh, through law school and, and with uh, actually working with the UN, right, um, in some capacities uh, from a few angles and has uh, really dug in deep um, to, to supporting uh, a few rapporteurs um, that are that I think we see are essential to access now's work. Um, so we were uh, uh, wondering 
on the concrete level, like what are best practices? Um, what makes a good special rapporteur from the eyes of civil society? And um, what, are, what practices do we want to promote for special rapporteurs who want to connect with and build on um, and advance the work of uh, our organizations? Great, thank you, Peter. And it's, it's great to join this discussion. I think it's important to note that when it comes to civil society as a stakeholder, civil society is not only committed to cooperating with the special rapporteur as indicated in the resolution, but we're also willing to support, as Tommaso highlighted, the mandate by informing the rapporteur of their work, uh, which is most often directly connected to the needs and interests of rights holders, those who are most at risk. So whomever steps into this role should have extensive experience and a proven commitment to work and interact with civil society um, and to speak with those um, whose right to privacy must have been violated or restricted. And I've indicated three best practices that I think uh, the rapporteur can particularly uh, keep in mind uh, to connect with and advance their work with civil society. So first is, as soon as the rapporteur steps into their role, they should reach out to their networks and connect with civil society to host consultations. But the rapporteur must be mindful of who is in the room, either in virtual or in person, there needs to be balance and representation. Um, to echo what Paula previously mentioned, it can't all be international civil society organizations. Uh, we must have regional and local organizations that provide more of a nuanced and grassroots understanding of these issues. And then throughout the consultations, the rapporteur said, uh, set an agenda for the year and commit to revisiting that agenda and assessing it throughout the year. Um, second, um, best practice that we've noticed in our engagement with rapporteurs is at least having the rapporteur or their staff uh, host standing meetings with civil society. This can either be monthly or biweekly meetings, but this really provides the opportunity for the rapporteur to brief civil society on their work, but then also civil society to update the rapporteur of what they're noticing in the global trends. Um, and so this helps more collaboration um, and receiving up-to-date information on country specific, but also thematic issues as well. And then finally, I can't help, but we have to talk about RightsCon. It's the world's leading summit on human rights in the digital age. And it really presents a great opportunity for rapporteurs to connect with stakeholders and not only civil society, but importantly, activists, activists from around the world. Um, so now the special rapporteur on privacy has an obvious role and a fit uh, within RightsCon, but other rapporteurs should not shy away from this important convening. Um, I think as, to, uh, as Nicholas actually highlighted, um, the, the pandemic is showing just how intertwined digital technologies are in our lives, everything from health to the environment. So it's not just a space for those with the obvious mandates. Um, I think it's an, a great opportunity to join other special rapporteurs um, and issuing joint statements as Nicholas also highlighted. Um, so for instance, last year we had six rapporteurs joined together in, an, in a statement warning of the closing of digital space amid COVID-19. Um, during RightsCon online. Thanks. Um, Got to get that RightsCon plug in. But uh, yeah, I would also love to hear from, from the rest of you, like what events, um, what are the, the touch points um, that you think should be on this person's calendar, um, you know, this rapporteur or others, um, in order to make those real connections with civil society? Um, and uh, yeah. Um, also looking at you know the the unfunded nature um, of this of this role that we've heard about, um, what does that mean in terms of uh, who who will fill this these shoes? Um, it seems like what's the profile of a usual rapporteur and um, what kind of people can afford this? Because usually we think of unfunded roles as pretty exclusionary, right? Um, they require you to come with uh, your own kind of in, maybe institutional connections. I don't know, independent wealth. Um, uh, so yeah, what, what's the kind of role um, that, that the profile of this common person um, and then uh, how should that change maybe? Um, I'd, I'd love to hear from uh, anyone who wants to speak up. But uh, Paola or Tommaso perhaps. Yeah, Tommaso, thanks. Thank you. Um, 
Well, I, I actually want to just uh, highlight one point that uh, that was touched upon uh, in terms of uh, the voluntary nature of uh, of the role, and uh, and it is the fact that uh, actually, uh, and I mean, and Nicholas also alluded to it. Uh, these uh, these kind of roles require quite a significant amount of time commitment by the by the candidate. Um, I think the office um, estimates around three months a year. And I think that's important to, to bear in mind that uh, um, because of the type of activities that the rapporteur is expected to conduct, uh, country visits, uh, but also analysis, uh, uh, responding to sometimes urgent uh, uh, issues, uh, uh, urgent allegations of violations, uh, um, or responding to a particular consultation, uh, which is important and needs to be done in a timely manner. Um, providing uh, right drafting and then uh, presenting the reports uh, at the council and the general assembly. Um, all these require quite a significant amount of time. Now the, the office of the high commissioner provides support, obviously, as you say, it's probably not enough uh, and other rapporteurs have uh, the benefit uh, of uh, uh, other external support as well. But what I'm, what I'm trying to flag here is that uh, it is uh, an unpaid job uh, that uh, also uh, requires a significant amount of, of time commitment. Uh, I think the rewards are, 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 are many, but uh, it's very important that uh, um, the, the person who applies uh, understands that, that, is, uh, that, is, uh, that it requires time and commitment to, to deliver the, the, the activities of, of the mandate. Thank you. Thank you, Tommaso. Um, yeah, it looks like Paula has uh, her hand up. Yeah, I think, um, well, the obvious conclusion that uh, you need the support to be coming from somewhere. Uh, we know that uh, the type of dedication that the mandate requires uh, means that um, someone will have to be supporting the special rapporteur. In general, that's what happens. Um, it's very common for rapporteurs to be connected to universities, so to research centers. Sometimes there are um, international organizations that support the role of the mandate. But of course, the type of people that have these contacts or that have access to a university, normally these are based in the, north, um, the global north, <laughs> where you can find this type of support available. So that really has an impact on um, the type of people that are willing and, 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 and are able to actually apply to these positions. So APC doesn't have an institutional position on how to address that and if the positions should be paid. I think there's a lot of risks in there as well, depending on where the, com the, 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 the funds come from. Um, there can be um, impact um, on, on the autonomy and uh, independence of the mandate. So this is something that has to be considered. But of course, we need to recognize um, the limitations that this uh, current system um, imposes. Thank you. Um, yeah, and uh, I think it's worth pulling out another limitation, um, which is uh, which is around gender. A lot of these repertoires, um, take for example, the special repertoire on freedom of expression had never been filled by um, a non-male uh, individual uh, until uh, just last year, um, and uh, you know, I don't know um, how or why that's that's been the case. But um, moving forward, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear if you have ideas. Moving forward, um, is that going to be a priority? Should that be a priority for you know those five ambassadors who are creating this short list to um, to to focus on and prioritize non male candidates and and what does gender mean i guess generally for um the right to privacy in the digital age i know it's a big topic yeah yeah because that's a, like in one word i would just say certainly that should be a, the, <laughs> that should be a criteria um we even have like coalitions of organizations that have been trying to raise this issue, um, the kind of disparities that you have in representation of women in this um, in these mandates in these types of role. So, uh, like in a nutshell, I would say certainly. Um, but then I have to say, um, I have to say that this 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 mandate has addressed gender um, in the past. So this is something that we really. 
recognized and, and um, we are we were pleased to see how gender concerns or gender perspectives to privacy were integrated into the mandate, especially in a, in a report that was uh, published in 2018. Um, and it was really like so it was there was a lot there so it's um, it's a report that not only looks at gender but looks at gender with an intersectionality approach um, and then it um, recognizes that privacy really creates the necessary space for people who face discrimination or marginalization based on their gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender based, um, gender expression, sorry, to fully express uh, and fully enjoy their human rights. Um, so it looked at privacy as really linked to, the, to privacy as protection against gender based violence, let's say. And I think um, that was really an important landmark in the work of, of the mandate. Um, there were a number of very interesting recommendations there. So for example, the, um, the rapporteur suggested the promotion of encryption tools to protect the rights of uh, and security of individuals and minority groups. There was also a recommendation about a type of gender assessment of uh, both to states and to companies, a gender assessment, um, impact assessment prior to the introduction of laws, of policies, um, and of services and products. So we think all of that was really interesting. Um, but um, we need to see more um, implementation of these recommendations. So I would say like looking at the future, um, it's really important to have another mandate holder that really takes these um, important standards in and, and develop them further in terms of like uh, thinking of different measures and different dialogues and different tools that could put together to continue to promote implementation of those recommendations. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're you're starting to uh, direct us towards kind of the substance of the the norms, what what the mandate has looked at and what it could look at. Um, yeah. And I, so let's let's keep going down that path. Um, and uh, you know that also makes me think of there is a thematic uh, theme uh, mandate holder on violence against women, right? So maybe that's another possible place for for collaboration. Um, Laura, I know um, that you've uh, been spending some time at, uh, at the Commission on Status of Women, uh, UN Women meetings, um, but uh, also want to think about what are some of the other places where this rapporteur may be able to open new doors, um, you know, use this uh, kind of this office, this august office, um, and then, yeah, also a little bit of that substance that, that Paolo was, was talking to about what they should be focusing on. Yeah, definitely. I think when we're asking the question of where can we open new doors, it's important to clarify who the rapporteur should open the door to and, and open it for. And that's civil society. Uh, we need rapporteurs, particularly the rapporteur on privacy, to help us turn the tide of securitization back towards civic space and push for more of an open human centric spaces. And there's many gaps currently in the UN system regarding the right to privacy. Um, first that I've noticed in terms of promoting and also assessing the state of the right to privacy worldwide. And I might segue a little bit, um, but it's in the UN's universal periodic review process, which is a review process of the human rights record of all UN member states and countries provide recommendations to each other um, in this process, there's an overwhelming gap of the number of recommendations on the right to, pro uh, to privacy across all country reviews. I, in my opinion, it's severely being overlooked right now. Um, so we need states to prioritize this fundamental right within this, this important review process. And that's something maybe the rapporteur can bring attention um, to states um, as they engage with in their mandate. And the second is in terms not directly related to the right to privacy itself, um, but ensuring that different stakeholders are accessing important UN forums um, that lead to the development of the right to privacy. And one in particular where civil society has 
continued to have to push and, and, and engage um, for broader, more inclusive engagement in a multilateral process um, was in the cyberspace discussions. So um, forums such as the open-ended working group on the development on the field of ICTs in the context of international security on the cybercrime process that's unfolding. Um, civil society really needs um, rapporteurs to come behind them and stand behind them and, and pushing, you know, having that influence in their reputable status that they have um, to push for more inclusivity of civil society in these spaces um, so that we can all together more meaningfully develop um, and implement the right to privacy worldwide. And then, yeah, and then finally, just wanted to, to take this opportunity to build off what Paula is saying um, in terms of the, the mandate holder and not having the gender focus, um, like having a non-male uh, representing the mandate. I think I just want to echo everything that she has previously said. And I, I find it interesting that the UN um, provides you know, a regional priority, uh, um, regional representation, they make sure that that's important to the mandate, but we're not seeing um, more of a prioritization of individuals with intersecting identities um, as a key factor within the mandate as well. And I think that's maybe something practically speaking, uh, we should push for more of. Fantastic, thanks. Um, yeah, I'd love to uh, add in some questions from, from folks watching on YouTube. So please use that chat box. Um, we're gonna um, go with a few more questions uh, to the crowd and then hopefully welcome uh, the former Special Rapporteur David Kay in a bit. Um, and uh, thanks all. Um, speaking about uh, the, the mandate holders uh, and where they come from, I think people are probably wondering um, if there's some kind of regional preference um, for this or other mandates. Um, do they try to rotate, you know, where the mandate holder is from? The uh, Joseph Kanatachi being from from Malta and Europe. Um, does that mean Europe won't be the site for the next one? Um, you know, where the next mandate holder comes from? Um, and then, yeah, it would just does it get complicated by the origin of this of this mandate and um, you know those revelations of mass surveillance? basically mostly by Five Eyes countries like the US um, uh, and its allies, uh, does that factor in? So I would throw that to uh, maybe Nicholas or Tommaso if you have thoughts. Come in a little bit on that too there. Um, you know, this, frankly, I think this is an issue that should be thought about and talked about more openly. Um, with some of the mandates in the past, there's been repetition in terms of the profile of the mandate holder across time. And then typically I think that has looked like regional repetition. Um, I think there is now an effort to talk more openly and, and with you know, greater attention to intersectionality and, and additional types of diversity. Um, is it enough? No, it's not. I think, however, and others on the panel may disagree with me on this, um, I think, however, that for those of people who are watching us now and thinking about whether they should apply for this position, um, there are a whole host of factors that should play into your decision making. We talked a lot about resources. We talked about your institutional support. We talked about the importance of this role and how sweeping some of its responsibilities are, as well as how broad the opportunities are. Um, we talked about your experience, your connections and willingness to hear from civil society. So I would advocate to all of you considering whether or not to assume this position, that you take a hard look at whether you, regardless of where you're from or what your particular community identity may be, you take a look at really whether you're truly open to and think you are able to hear from the diversity of communities that are going to look for your, your leadership and assistance, because that group will be broad. Um, you know, as Paula pointed out, the last rapporteur was a man, but was able to, and I think with some success, consider gender issues. So you, you can do that too, but the key is being open to it. And Peter, I'm going to kind of abuse the microphone a little bit because I think we've been talking a lot as a bunch of experts about, you know, details of what the mandate might do, what kind of support they have. But the people who are listening to us right now are presumably considering whether or not they want to jump into this spot. And so I'm just going to put out there my view that you should 
you should try. If you're taking this time right now to listen to us and you've hung in with us for 50 minutes, try it because this is an incredibly important position. It's a big sacrifice. It'll require an enormous investment, but it's also a critical part of the international human rights architecture. And without somebody strong and committed to the, to the right to privacy in this position, we will all be worse off. And so if you think you want to do this and you're really committed and you're open to inputs from different people, don't let a concern about the bureaucracy or the lack of support stop you now because we will find that, you know, there's a community that will be backing you up and supporting you in this work. So try it, go for it. It's really important. Thanks so much. Um, I, I think that positive uh, encouragement is something we really all um, can stand behind here. Um, I wanted to, yeah, and maybe we can push this to David Kay. I don't know. I, I, I had a vision there for a second of like the the elders or the the Avengers, the former uh, special rapporteurs, kind of um, forming like an, an alumni body to help you know spur more uh, attention and interest in in holding these roles. Um, but uh, uh, thinking, yeah, about um, you know the the longer term scale of the way that um, this mandate has developed um, and uh, you know the, the support from the OHCHR itself. Uh, I think you know we've talked mostly about public sector um, work, whether it's you know the governments who supported this mandate, the governments who maybe don't totally support this mandate, um, and, but you know all the governments that are engaged in, in mass surveillance and um, targeted surveillance and trying to uh, skill up and level up and um, increase their budgets for it. And we've also talked about the UN and that system. Um, I think what we're, we've, we've left out is the private sector, you know, those companies that are advancing computing, are advancing the collection of data and building entire systems and ecosystems um, that are run by data and uh, really depend on, you know, commodifying and monetizing and sharing and processing personal information at uh, you know, faster and faster rates. So um, I would put this broadly, I think, where does um, the private sector uh, fit into the work of the special procedures generally? Have you seen good examples of mandate holders speaking to um, uh, the uh, the roles of companies. Um, and, you know, as I think David Kay had once proposed, should there be country visits to corporate campuses and, um, uh, you know, putting them in the spotlight? Tomasa? Thank you. Um, well, I, I mentioned it earlier that the, the resolution on the right to privacy in the digital age uh, has uh, evolved to start looking also at the role of company, the responsibility of companies. Uh, um, and uh, so the responsibilities uh, uh, in terms of uh, respecting protecting human rights, but also the, uh, the obligation of states uh, uh, in regulating companies so that they uh, protect rights from abuses. Um, and I think that's definitely an area that uh, um, the special rapporteur will be um, I mean, you know, will be useful for 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 uh, for them to 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 develop. Uh, yeah, you mentioned a special rapporteur on on, uh, on freedom of expression as an example of um, of looking at companies. I remember also other um, rapporteurs uh, together looking at uh, the role of the surveillance industry and and concerns around it. Uh, uh, so it was maybe as an example that Nicholas will, will talk more, but it's a more of an example also of a joint sort of type of work among mandate holders. Um, and, and I think uh, even, even looking at uh, the, the UN uh, Office of the Commission for Human Rights, the sort of uh, uh, the exploration of the responsibility of companies uh, has, uh, has developed quite significantly, even in the context of the right to privacy. Uh, their last uh, thematic reports of uh, 2018 uh, also uh, uh, develops some of the some of the sort of um, um, yardstick in terms of uh, of uh, of how to uh, assess companies' responsibility with regards to the right to privacy. And I think uh, it's definitely an area where uh, the development of uh, um, the interpretation of the law 
as it stands and, uh, and, and of standards. And I'm thinking in particular like of data protection type of issues uh, is something that uh, um, is, is, um, is needed and, and it would be good to, to develop further. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I suppose companies, uh, we wouldn't want companies to maybe fund the mandates, but um, they are increasingly working with their CHR. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts on that question? Well, I'll just, um, just to support what Tomazo was saying, I think this, sorry, I jumped in front of you, Laura, you were being nice and raising your hand and I just took, the, uh, but just, um, I, I really feel that um, at this point we have this clarity that there is an, a, an obligation to respect human rights. Um, so, and in today's world, it's impossible to think of this mandate if it doesn't look at the role of the private sector. Um, so this is going for sure to be a priority, um, not only for the mandate, but as Tomaso was saying, th there are developments underway. If you look at business and human rights at the UN, we are entering a new, um, a new, a new time or a, a new look into these issues. I think uh, on the past, um, business and human rights was a lot about um, natural resources and extractive industry. And I really feel that this new phase will really focus on uh, the role of uh, big technological companies. So yes, just supporting that um, there is, um, it, it's important. I think there needs to be some kind of multi stakeholder dialogue because the recommendations would, um, it, we need to think how these recommendations could be taken in by the private right. sector. So there's a lot to be developed there, but for sure it's, uh, it's a main concern. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these reports are presented at, say, the Human Rights Council, their General Assembly, where states are the ones who can interrogate the, the mandate holders and ask the questions, right? So, um, you know, how would you actually present those uh, to the companies? Um, thanks, uh, Laura. Uh, nicely waiting. Uh, did you want to come in? Yeah, um, I just wanted to highlight the UN Secretary General's roadmap on digital cooperation. Um, for those who may not be aware, um, the roadmap was issued last June, um, and it aims to provide concrete actions to connect, respect, and protect people in the digital age. At Access Now, we were actually co-champions on the digital human rights section of the roadmap, and that particular section in the roadmap has a lot on the right to privacy. There's a section on data protection and privacy, on digital identity. All of these intersect with the Rapporteur on Privacy's mandate. And in fact, the, the Rapporteur on Privacy has been involved in this process as a key constituent. But there's one um, particular point that relates to the role of tech companies and trying to hold tech companies accountable. And that's the, the call that the Secretary General issued um, to, for technology leaders to urgently and publicly to acknowledge the importance of protecting the right to privacy and other human rights in the digital space and to take clear company specific actions to do so. Um, so I think the special rapporteur um, can really help bring this recommendation to fruition uh, and push it forward. I think that would be another, in, in answering my previous question that Peter posed, another way that the rapporteur can really get heavily involved in um, processes that will help uh, further advance the right to privacy. Awesome, thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, it's interesting to see that roadmap process and. Um, you know, a part, another part of that was the creation of this uh, UN Office of the Tech Envoy reporting directly to the Secretary General. Um, it's been some hiccups in getting that uh, off the ground, but um, uh, yet another place, I think, for the Special Rapporteur to, to speak to, right? Um, great, thanks. Um, I'd love to do a lightning round of just uh, you know, what the first report should be about um, uh, for the, this next mandate holder. Um, maybe we can go... <laughs> uh, Left to right on my screen is Laura, Nicholas, Paula, Tommaso, uh, and then David Kay, who has um, who has joined us. Uh, so yeah, just a lightning round. What should the first report be about? Um, <laughs> I think you were starting with me, Peter. Um, I just think that the first report. It's hard to think of one specific topic that it yep. should be about, given um, given COVID. But yeah. 
yeah so kind of COVID. well you can say COVID. you know say like um civic space and the way that yeah the, shrinking uh, civic space and, yeah. and more of the intersection of privacy and you know health the right to health and other other issues nice yeah thanks nicholas i wouldn't go for COVID. Mm -hmm. um, i might consider broadening it to the collection of health information and possibly biometric information as well thanks health and biometrics yeah uh paula <laughs> Sorry, you got mine. So I I was really looking <laughs> yeah. there, there was a preliminary report on the impact of COVID, but it was a preliminary one. I think we really need something more updated at this point. So I was also going with um, the impact of COVID because I thought it would also be like broad and kind of mapping, looking at the future. Thanks. Yeah, um, uh, absolutely, Tomasa. Well, I, I'm going to be contrarian and say that uh, I don't feel like uh, suggesting uh, a report uh, for his uh, for his or her first report, um, because I think uh, that's uh, that's a good thing about uh, having an independent uh, special rapporteur is that uh, uh, they will uh, develop their agenda with our support. Uh, the other reason that I haven't really. Um, there are so many of the things that you just mentioned that that could uh, could potentially be uh, a priority that is very difficult to kind of pin pin one down. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I'd like to welcome uh, David Kay, uh, the former special rapporteur on freedom of expression, um, current uh, independent board chair at the Global Network Initiative, and uh, also still I think a law professor law professor in his spare time at uh, University of California Irvine. So. Hi, David. Hey, Peter. Sorry to be late. It's all right. Um, thanks. Yeah, we've got about, I think, 10 minutes left on the Zoom counter. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, any initial thoughts you have? Um, we've talked a lot about the nuts and bolts of, um, of mandates in general, about uh, where this one came from, uh, and, uh, and then a little bit about the substance, as you've heard, um, about where we want to see it go. But um, mm -hmm. Yeah, where would you like to see this this mandate go, and um, what's the kind of profile maybe of the person you think is is best place to take it there? Yeah, I mean, I, so first of all, thanks for organizing this. I think this is this kind of event is really important because so much of special procedures and selection is in a black box, and I think that's also something people should be um, should be mindful of that. You know, there, there's an open portion of the selection, which is individuals put their names forward or others put their names forward and that's public, but, but then a consultative group, that group of ambassadors, um, you know, there's no, no clear standards as to how, uh, you know, that large group, which could be any number of people is taken down to five or six in a short list of people who are interviewed, and then a ranked number of three people, you know, there's there's really no there's no explanation of that uh, of what the criteria might be, and um, I think that's problematic. The lack of transparency there is problematic because it gives uh, it gives us all sorts of ideas about you know why any particular person uh, is selected. But I, but I, I say that only. I mean, not to su suggest there's any bad faith in the process, only that it's it's very unclear as to you know what makes a successful candidate. Let's say, I, I think Tommaso's last point um, resonates with me in the sense that I don't I don't really think it's necessary or even um, uh, important or or wise necessarily for a, a either candidate or an incoming rapporteur to say off the bat, you know, I've got three to six years. That means I have, you know, six to 12 reports to the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly. And here I'm gonna tell you what they're gonna be. I think it's much better. And I mean, this is a little bit self-serving because this is when I was a rapporteur, I really benefited from civil society from, I mean, really the organizations that are represented here, to be honest, you know, for the rapporteur to spend the first few months um, really uh, meeting with people. I mean, obviously we're, we're in virtual space 
now that in some ways makes it a little bit easier um, to, to reach out to people and to have transparent meetings with civil society to identify, you know, what are the areas of greatest concern? Uh, and not only what are the areas of greatest concern, but also, you know, there, there's, there's sort of a, a kind of complex of factors that might go into deciding where a rapporteur's focus would be most beneficial. You know, like where, where are there normative gaps at the international level? Um, where are there gaps of protection? And I think, you know, thinking about those two different things is also valuable because we might think, well, you know, privacy as compared to freedom of expression um, is, I mean, frankly, um, pre presents us with a less thick array of normative standards, at least at the UN level. Um, and in part, that's because of, um, you know, the, the, the work of the Human Rights Committee and, you know, the, there's just fewer kind of cases. There's not a rich general comment as we have with general comment 34. Hopefully, that would be on the Human Rights Committee's agenda. But so there, there's a kind of a network of questions there, but also there are questions of protection. And I mean, I come at this thinking in terms of, you know, surveillance, particularly targeted surveillance and the fact that, you know, there are very limited tools for implementation and enforcement of those norms um, that I think have been developing over the last several years. So I think there's a lot of room for the rapporteur to have conversations with civil society before kind of locking into an agenda. And I, I think that kind of approach is, uh, is one that tends to work well. Thanks, absolutely. And, and uh, yeah, I think we'd love to see your, your playbook for a su successful rapporteur, um, you know, uh, set out the, the checklist, although I'm sure it does vary by mandate. Um, yeah, I want to open up for others, but you know, you mentioned state surveillance, right? And I think state surveillance was really the um, origin story for this mandate. Uh, and then in your work as um, the rapporteur on expression, uh, you you focus on encryption and anonymity, and then uh, called for a moratorium on the sale, transfer, and use of surveillance tech. Um, uh, you know, just to be to put it out there, do you hope that this this uh, mandate holder takes up the mantle of that call and, and advances that moratorium? Sure. Yeah, that's that's an easy question. <laughs> yes, of course. I hope that you know um, the next rapporteur um, believes you know with whatever agenda I would suggest. But, but you know, that isn't the only agenda. And I think, yeah. I think one, of the, uh, one of the interesting issues, uh, and, and I mean, this is obviously uh, kind of a, a, um, a post Snowden world that we live in that people really do recognize the connections between privacy and the enjoyment of all other rights. And this, you know, this was a very common refrain and remains a common refrain for freedom of expression. And it's also more general when we think about the interdependence of human rights. But I think that, um, that I think there's been more on the normative side that has highlighted the way in which privacy is, is a kind of gateway right to so many other rights. And, you know, to the extent that a, you know, a privacy rapporteur can, can see that, you know, can see Article 17 in particular as, as a gateway to discuss all sorts of issues that should be on the agenda but aren't necessarily always on the agenda, I think it'll be really valuable. I mean, just to give an example, the connections between, you know, privacy and the right to peaceful assembly and association. I mean, that's, that's a real... Um, I think rich area to both expand on why privacy is so valuable and how the law can articulate that value, but also how it can connect to something that's fundamental to not just human development as you know, freedom of expression and freedom of belief and conscience uh, might be, but also to you know, the, the pillars of democratic life. Um, so I think there's a lot of room to do that kind of work. And of course, 
you know, targeted surveillance is very much a part of interfering with, with all of those other rights as well. Thank you, David. Um, and I think we're going to wrap it up um, pretty soon here. Uh, thanks for those concluding remarks. Um, anyone else has uh, any burning last uh, points? But I think we've heard, yeah, from a, a number of you, different collab potential collaborations, um, whether it's the Special Rapporteur on Countering Terrorism on Violence Against Women, you know, Freedom of Association and Assembly, um, and of course, uh, uh, Expression. Um, and uh, yeah, we look forward to, to more fruitful collaboration among rapporteurs and among, and of course, with led by and, and closely with civil society. Um, so yeah, uh, again, uh, you, heard, you heard the speakers, apply now, um, get your applications in early. Uh, and uh, we really look forward to working with you. Um, thank you to all the speakers and thank you to you at home. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Take care, everyone.